All right, hello everyone. Welcome to our fourth semi-annual Catalyst Day. We are now moving to our presentations by our Catalyst 300 groups. And so our first Catalyst 300 group is group three, and they are going to be discussing the impacts of coffee on families in Ethiopia. My name is Natalie. I'm Morgan. I'm Ryan. I'm Jacob. And I'm Joe. Before we get into more of our presentation, we're going to start with a few questions. To participate, please use the reaction button. Um, so our first question is, hit the button if you consider yourself to be a coffee drinker. Okay, now hit the button if you know where your coffee comes from. Um, how many children do you think are involved in child labor? Hit the button if you think it's less than 1 million. Now hit the button if you think it's more than 1 million. Okay, and then the last question we have for you today is, if um, so, hit the button if you think you would change your shopping habits to um, account for child labor happening in the coffee industry. Cool. When asked similar questions, 73% of Americans um, guessed there were fewer than 1 million children involved in child labor. However, as you can see on the infographic, 150 million children aged 5 to 14 um, are engaged in child labor worldwide. Additionally, more than three quarters of Americans reported they would change their shopping habits to account to respond to the usage of child labor. So why is it important to care about child labor? Well, in Ethiopia, 90% of children reported they were working to support the family income or at least to help improve it. In the next portion of the presentation, Morgan will go more on depth in this, but children working in the coffee industry or any, any industry for that matter, have a harder time getting the education they need in order to break the cycle of working for survival. Since the families are already poverty stricken, there are, there are additional barriers um, that keep the children out of education. And these barriers combined with the fact that the children are trying to work on top of receiving an education leads to mentally and physically exhausted children. Starbucks, one of the biggest chain coffee companies in the United States has taken advantage of the cheap Ethiopian coffee and labor and made corrupt trade deals with the Ethiopian government. The deal originally seemed beneficial to both parties because Starbucks offered to trademark the Ethiopian coffee and ultimately increase the value of it around the world. If this worked, the wages of the coffee workers on the small family plantations would have hypothetically increased. Instead, Starbucks used this deal as an opportunity to monopolize on the coffee and get rid of any competitors. In America, they raised the price of their coffee products by nine cents. They did not share any of this extra profit with Ethiopian coffee farmers, and farmers only made about three cents for every cup of Starbucks coffee that was sold. Because Ethiopia is allegedly the world's place of coffee, Starbucks has also used this as a way to market the coffee. The only involvement that Starbucks had with the Ethiopian coffee farmers throughout this deal was to increase crop quality and yield in order to benefit only the company. This further hurt the workers because they were working harder to produce a better crop and even more crops with the same understaffed amount of workers to begin with. It also contributed to the need for families to keep their children in the workforce in order to help out. Although Ethiopia has tried to negotiate other deals, Starbucks and Ethiopia still have this corrupt trade deal to this day. As we'll see later on in a graph, Ethiopian children have very high dropout rates and struggle to complete even their primary education. One study in Ethiopia recently found that children working below the legal age have higher rates of developing behavioral and emotional disorders. A few of these disorders include in isolation and depression, which are exaggerated when the children are not able to interact regularly with their peers. 
All the results of child labor are fatigue and lack of attention when they're able to attend school. All of these things pre prevent children from developing healthy minds as they grow. Aside from needing a higher family income, another factor to consider as to why children are involved in the workforce is the barrier to receive education due to the distance schools are located from homes, the lack of money to purchase school supplies in order to be successful in their studies, and the lack of trained educators. Rather than making an effort to overcome educational barriers, families instead choose the easier route of forcing their children to work with them in the coffee fields. Found by the Bureau of International Affairs, this graph represents children of 7 to 14 in Ethiopia. Of these, 41.5% or about 10 million are involved in some type of labor and 30.8% participate in the workforce while simultaneously attending school. This is the primary reason why many children have fatigue, issues focusing, and other behavioral problems attending school and being, being involved in the workforce at the same time. Although 70.1% of children are involved in school, only 54.3% of children between the ages of seven and 14 complete primary school in Ethiopia. The amount of children that are eligible to further their education and as a result keeps them stuck in the workforce early on in their lives. At one point, Ethiopia took steps to enforce child labor laws. To do this, they hired and trained 110 inspectors whose primary job would be to go around the country and find the family businesses that were using child labor to profit in the coffee industry. Unfortunately, the fines were not very high, which didn't make them that big of an incentive to keep children out of the workforce. Instead, the families would pay the small fines to make their children continue working. These regulations were difficult to enforce because of the inspectors. The International Labor Organization recommended that in order to in stopping child labor, the country would have needed over 1,300 to, to be even proportionate to the Ethiopian population. There are some existing solutions that are in place. The first existing solution that is currently in place is called the Central Public Works Program. This program tries to support the families. They do this by trying, by providing resources to families that have people that are physically unable to work in the household. They try to increase the food quality along with the food sources that the families have access to as well. Additionally, the program tries to help kids attend and stay in school. The program does this in two different ways. The first being that they assist the families by giving them money that the program has raised. The second is that they are helping families receive loans. The second solution is the International Institute, Institute of Rural Reconstruction. This program is focused on improving third world countries education system and public health. They are doing this by trying to raise awareness. They are located mainly in the rural areas. This is good, but it also falls short in giving aid to the majority of the population. Then. This is extremely important because only about 7% of children are registered with the Ethiopian government. By registering their children, they are more easily kept out of the workforce and they can be placed into a school, school to receive an education. By receiving an education, they can then understand the importance of registering their children and the cycle can hopefully end them. Our third existing solution is a fair trade program. This program make sure that farmers are getting fair prices for their crops and they also set child labor laws. If you are 15 years of age or younger, you are not able to work in the workforce or for the company or the, or the farms. If you're between the ages of 16 to 18, you're unable to work if this interferes with your schooling in any way. The downside to this program is that you have to be registered with the fair trade program to receive the benefits from it and have the child labor laws enforced. The final existing solution is in, that is in place is uh, having current or past criminals come into the workforce. This program is where newly released prisoners or current inmates go and work on the farms instead of the children. So building more prisons doesn't help bring the crime rate down. Helping the current or past inmates get a job when released from prison can help as a correctional needs. This is also a way to help break the cycle of repeat offenders. 
Currently, there are 31 cooperatives that are successfully running a business while employing current or past in inmates. This isn't a direct way of making sure the kids receive an education, but this would be the first step in, take, in making sure that they are not in the workforce. There are some setbacks to this solution though. The first being is that they need to find the farms that want to hire these current or past inmates. And then the second is that the farms and companies that need to pay these people more and then they would pay the children that they have working for them. Our proposed solution is to require coffee companies that in some way exploit farmers to include a warning label on their products. The label is clearly visible on the front and is worded in such a way that consumers can easily understand that the product they are buying is the result of child labor. This label also references a website where more extensive information can be found. The presentation of this is difficult is, is different from fair trade labeling because our label doesn't require the consumer to do any research to understand what the label means. Our criteria for what qualifies as exploitative will be passed through the FDA, who will then be in charge of inspecting farms. For a, co for a company to not be considered exploitative, they must at least meet the following standards. There are no children working on any farm which sells to the company. All workers, including those the farms that are, that are bought from, are paid a wage which meets the needs for housing, water, electricity, utilities, food, and any type of schooling. All workers who work in physically dangerous conditions are given health insurance relative to the risk of injury. Companies that buy from smallholder farms must economically contribute to the respective communities' schooling and transportation. To begin to see this program implemented into the U.S., we believe that governmental backing is required to ensure that uh, U.S. companies are held accountable because if a U.S. company is aware of their violation of ethical practices, they may choose not to devote additional resources to correcting that issue, thus losing their economical advantage over the rural communities that they're procuring resources from. There have been several guiding programs that have aided companies to safer business practices but we believe our program would enforce these existing guidelines. Programs such as the UN Global Compact and the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights both outline the integrities that businesses should uphold for their workers. But for companies that operate under unethical practices, these programs have little impact. A successful US program that has been implemented has been the Country of Origin Labeling or the COOL program. This requires all meat and fish imports to be specifically labeled with their country of origin. This is a heavily mandated and enforced program that requires companies to display accurate information to consumers. In a consumer survey, nine out of 10 US consumers are in favor of this labeling program. And in addition, consumers have said that they would like to see more information being required on these products that they're purchasing such as where these specific food items were processed at. This shows that consumers are aware of what they're buying. And in addition, they would like to have more information included on the products that they're purchasing in stores. We realize that this need to conform to our program would create lots of stress on companies who can't make the costly alterations to their business practices. Through our program, companies may pursue the Market Development Corporator Program or the MDCP Award. This support includes financial and technical assistance from the International Trade Administration for companies to compete in international markets. This grant is awarded to companies who generate export and sustain US-based jobs. The, there are limited MDCP awards given out at any time, roughly around 18. This would create competitiveness between companies who can't make the costly alterations to their business practices due to the standards of our program. Uh, this program enacts a partnership between the ITA and these companies, having the companies agree to pay two-thirds of the project cost, and as well as 
ensure that they will continue their ethical business practices once the MDCP award period is over. Uh, the award period lasts around three years, depending on the needs of each project. This design would allow our program to safely transition companies from unethical to more ethical practices. And in addition, this funding option would allow us to support struggling companies until they're uh, able to support themselves and the farms that they align with. This would create a gradual trend of companies making safer alterations to their business practices. The fair trade system has been successful in many aspects, but our program would be modeled after the existing system and accentuate on minor flaws that are in its design. Similarly to the fair trade system, we would implement the third party certification system where all members associated in the business parties would be uh, would have uh, meetings being held. Uh, there'd be an FDA representative present along with the rural farming community and the interested companies wanting to procure their resources. The FDA representative would be present to mediate between the two parties and work to establish a fair price for the crops. In addition, we would like to have an FDA representative stationed in these rural communities to oversee routine business and to advocate for these farmers. A way that we would like to develop the previous aspects further would be to have the FDA making more routine audits in these rural communities. The fair trade system is operated by making yearly audits in some of these rural communities. This long period between audits would leave farmers susceptible to being taken advantage of by companies. Differently to the fair trade system, our premium profits that are being collected would be devoted solely to the development of the educational resources in these communities whereas fair trades premium profits are devoted to multiple resources that the community sees fit to devote towards. While this method has been successful with fair trade, we believe that the sole devotion to the, economic, the educational resources in these communities would result in a higher economically stable environment. Since our program leads to a decrease in demand for exploitative companies, there is a concern that the loss of profit could lead to smallholder farmers' wages suffering more than they did in the first place. Even in the process of being inspected and approved as non-exploitative, the period of time when demand would decrease could cause the farmers this program intends to benefit to economically struggle if precautions are not taken. To avoid this, one of the requirements for a farm to be non-exploitative is for them to increase their farmer's wages. So even as a parent company is losing profit, the farmers themselves will be prospering. Still, it would be unethical for parent companies who change their policies to continue to lose profit as they wait to be approved as non-exploitative. To speed up the inspection process, the FDA will hire Ethiopian inspectors and outsource US inspectors if need be to the rural areas with a high farming population. A 2020 survey by the International Labor Organization predicted that if 75% of US adults who drink coffee were aware of which companies were exploitative, they would stop buying from those companies. A 2015 survey by the National Coffee Association reported that 76% of US adults regularly drank coffee during 2015. Assuming that both of these statistics are reliable, this model would mean that our solution would lead to exploitative coffee companies losing about 187.07 million US consumers. In addition to the warning of unethical labouring violations, companies must also include the conscious coffee seal on their product so that consumers can clearly see that their company is being monitored by an uncorrupt governmental program. In addition, companies must also display our QR code so that if a consumer wishes to learn more, they may go to our website to do so. On our website, we, our main draws to our website is our homepage that details our mission to eliminate child labor. We have a donation tab that anyone is free to donate to any of our active programs. And our main draw of our website is our active coffee equality map that details all registered coffee farms in Ethiopia, as well as the US-based companies that are aligned with them. 
This map details the ethical labor status for each community, detailing if they are being underpaid, if child labor has been used, or any other violations of our program. We believe this method of public display gives everyone relatively easy access to learn more about the problem, and as well as gives them the option to donate or to make a difference through uh, active endorsement of certain products. Do you have any questions? Let's give a round of applause. So for questions, you are either welcome to put those questions into the chat directly, or you can let us know that you would like to speak and we can call on you to ask those questions. I will start, then it gives people time to make a, a choice about what they wanna ask. Uh, but, so one of my questions was, are you guys labeling only non-exploitative or would you also label the ones that are exploitative as exploitative? That part I was a little unsure about. Yeah, so um, the requirements of our product would require that all of these, all of the companies associated with the rural farms would uh, have to label, label their status. So it's kind of more incentive-based if they are properly supporting these communities, they can display that information that would reflect a positive light on their product. But um, through our audits by the, made by the FDA, if they're not meeting our standards, they would be required to display that information. And, and what would that look like? Um, for the um, exploitative aspects that companies would have to be required, would be required to display, um, there would be certain guidelines that would, would uh, require them to clearly display that they, certain aspects that they're in violation of. Um, for the public, of course, it can't be like exactly specific, but just um, referencing the underpayment, the working conditions that they are subjecting these people to, and any other violations of our program. Other questions? I have a question in the chat. Would the exploitative and non-exploitative labels be standardized? Um, so the, um, sorry, I had to unshare that to get to the mic. Um, the exploitative labels would be, there's no, um, for our program, we're not requiring a non-exploitative label. It's more that just if a company doesn't have the exploitative label, you can assume it makes sense to assume that they're not exploiting child labor with them. But the label that says like this product is the result of child labor, that would be standardized. Other questions? So do you view this as more as a reward-based incentive or a punishment-based? Um, we view this more as a reward-based incentive. Um, this program would be more um, along the lines of having the US government advocate for these companies that have been taking advantage of these, com these communities. While it is, um, there's definitely a carrot and a stick um, you know, for these companies that are not actively involved in the communities that they are partnered with. Um, of course, there is, they would see a very steep decline in consumer endorsement, whereas um, we believe that the display of more ethical status for certain products, people would be uh, more willing to purchase those. Other questions? All right, I have more questions. So if no one else will ask, I'll ask more questions. <laughs> um, so you talked about your FDA um, as inspectors in 
Ethiopia. And is that something that they do now? Or is FDA in charge of that inspection process? Or is it usually an outside organization? And, and what are the implications of that? So um, with what, sure. if you wanted to answer it, you can go. OK. Um, so what's going on with that is what Morgan mentioned earlier in the slide was um, she was talking about how the Ethiopian government already has 110 inspectors. So that's something that the Ethiopian government is doing. What we're talking about has is having the FDA aid them. Um, so this what's going what was already going on was not through the FDA. This is just our proposed solution is to have the FDA do. And so would that require like more tax money for the FDA to be running that and financing that? Yeah, most likely. All right, last chance for questions. I'm not seeing any, although it's hard for me to flip through. All right, let's give him one more round of applause. Thank you for joining us.